saw, so maybe I was not in the desert. It is well. It is well. <laughs> yeah, what can you do anyhow? It's winter, so it's good to get extra fat anyway. The less, uh, the more fat, the less power bill. So you get big people like us don't pay much for hydro in the winter. <laughs> There's always a benefit to everything, amen. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> amen. Okay, this morning, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 to 21. For many work of whom I have told you often, now tell you even weeping. I'll read that again. For many work of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, not enemies of Jesus. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things? For our conversation is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I say to you, many work, I say to you with weeping, I say this unto you with tears in my eyes, this is Apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi, and uh, this was uh, years after his divine encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. And in the subsequent verses, verse 10 of chapter 3, and you begin to see him weep and cry. And he said that I may know him. I want to know him. And sometimes when I read that scripture and I said, Paul, what are you talking about? I thought you had an encounter with him on the way to Damascus. I thought you had a wonderful visitation. And I thought after that you went to Arabia and then you were endued. And the Lord showed you many things that mouths could not even author. And then you began to preach and signs and wonders have been wrought by your hands. What are you talking about? And I want to know him. There was a passionate cry in the heart of poor who wanted to know him and the power of his resurrection. He said, not that I've already obtained all that, but I follow after that I may apprehend that which I've been apprehended of. That is how he caught me on a way. He said, I'm following, I'm following, I'm passionately, you know, I've been subdued by the master so that I can do his bidding and his bidding only. I'm not done yet. There is still many aspects of God that I've not come to understand. But I'm not going to give up. There are questions that I cannot answer right now in relation to my work with the Lord. But one thing I do, in verse 14 of chapter 3, is the one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, and I just keep pushing towards the mark of a high calling in Christ Jesus. I don't know the answers. I don't know why. I pray sometimes and, and people get healed and some don't get healed. I don't know why. When I pray and somebody dies and the other one leaves, I don't know why. Where the righteous can be plagued with so many afflictions. The Bible said many are the afflictions of the righteous. How can the righteous be afflicted? I thought affliction is only meant for sinners and those who do wickedly. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord deliver them from them all. How can the righteous be afflicted? Is that not a contradiction of the promises of God that he told us? 
in this world. And, and this, I believe, we're in part of the struggle that people like Paul and had in the past. So if you're struggling with so many things about your work with the Lord and you still don't understand, child of God, you're in good company. We don't have answers to so many things. You say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I can be so faithful to serving God with all my strength and all my might and training and bringing my children up in the ways of the Lord and now they're not serving that same God with me. And that woman who is a crack addict and crack everything and now her son is a pastor. I don't know. I don't know why. A prostitute who is going through hundreds and tens of abortion and still keep having children. And Sarah had to wait till the night for you. I don't know. But all this, I was still keep pressing on to the mark of her calling in Christ Jesus. And so I don't know. We don't know the answers to so many things that begot us, that befall us of the children of God. But the point is this morning, like Paul, if we become too earthly conscious, and I realize that communication is a key to every healthy relationship. And the problem with us as a church, if I take it back a little bit, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm not as accurate as I'm just going to speculate here. And so don't take my word for what I'm just going to say right now. I'm just speculating. I'm not, and this is more like what I call my speculative theology. That in the last 35 to 40 years, the church has been communicating the mind of God to us wrong. And that has become the reason why so many of us are disappointed with God, angry at God. Because everything they told, it is not my fault that I believe God to be healed and didn't get healed. It's not my fault that I'm angry with that situation because my pastor told me if only I have faith enough and I put all my faith together and yet I didn't get healed. And so is that something that's wrong with the word of God because I've examined myself and I, I can't see anything wrong with me. I have followed all the tenets of the words of men, all the requirements. They told me if I sow a seed of faith, my business will do well. And now my business has gone bankrupt. And what is wrong with well, that? Because they communicated the mind of God to you and me wrongly. There was nothing wrong with the word of God. There is nothing wrong with the integrity and the truth of God. There is nothing wrong with the all-powerful, almighty God. The Lord God, our God, does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Nobody told me when I came into the Pentecostal charismatic movement that the righteous could be afflicted. Because all they told me is that if I'm afflicted, it's because I don't have enough faith. Nobody showed me the scripture that said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. They didn't tell me that. Nobody told me that. All they told me was believe the sow the seed and believe in the Lord. If you can fast, if you can move mountains, if you believe. And I believe how fast that will ever come like a pole. And yet nothing is changing. Because nobody told me that many are the afflictions of the righteous, that the righteous can be afflicted, that the righteous can go through trials. 
Nobody told me that there's somewhere in the scripture in Isaiah 43 that said, when I go through the waters, they didn't tell me that. They told me if I start coming to church every Sunday, I'll be exempted from trials. <coughs> That's what they told me. And so when I start coming to your church and the trouble keep multiplying and I stop coming, don't blame me because you talk because you are not as advertised. That is the latest thing on TV I hear. Yeah. <laughs> Because we pet on the truth wrongly. Is it that God does not heal, he still heals? Is it that God cannot deliver, he still delivers? The most important thing. Nobody told me that Isaiah for the truth, so when I go through the fires of life, it will not burn me. He didn't say that I will be exempted from fire. He said I will go through fire. And so if your marriage is on fire, you are in good company. If you are sick in your body this morning, you are in good company. So Paul says, I say this with weeping, that many have become the enemies of the cross. But I realized that I did not become an enemy of the cross intentionally. It was because of the wrong communication. Because the only thing they told me in the name of Jesus. So many are friends with Jesus because at the mention of his name, every knee bow. Call the name of Jesus seven times and the demons will flee. Yeah? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you must Right? When I come in the name of Jesus, who have the power to uphold, in the name of Jesus, we have a victory. So I'm in love with Jesus. I love Jesus. But I'm enemy of the cross that authenticate Jesus. And they said, why do we become the enemy of the cross? It's self-explanatory. He said, whose God is their belly? When the kingdom becomes about here and now, only, whose glory is in their shame? Who might want earthly things as the essence of that which is to pray? Listen to me. We are not in this just for here and now. If only in this world you have hope, you will be of all men most miserable. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose what he sold? But I'm yet, I'm yet to see any man that has even gained the whole nation. So if the fruitless pursuit that's what they call it, what? Pursuit of happiness. You will never catch it. You will never catch it. Pursuit of happiness, you will pursue and you will never catch happiness. Because happiness is mundane, it's momentary, it's temporal, but joy is everlasting. Jesus said, in this world you will have what? Tribulation. They didn't tell me that. Nobody told me that. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't be here this morning. They told me that from the beginning. In this is, is a call to die. That is what Christianity is all about. Is a call to death. Is a death sentence. Reason why a sister can give a testimony is, is it because when you die, you die. This is not a comfortable thing. The cross signifies death. 
signifies total surrender to the ultimate power that is able to give you a new beginning. What we have promoted in the last 35 to 40 years is the bunch of selfish, self-centered Christians. And that's what we do. It's not your fault, it's not my fault. That's what they sold us. It's all about me. It's all about I feel good. It's about me, 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 me. You know what I mean? God is going to bless you. The truth is, God does all that. But that's not the reason why. If that is all, if that's all you need for life, coming to church is the wrongest place to be. Let me use that English. If your life, if your desire is a pursuit of happiness, child of God, you better know for motivational speakers and go to their meetings. That is more, that is the more realistic place to be than in the house of God. But unfortunately, many of the churches have become more of a motivational speaking place than a place of life. And God wants to change that. So when we create our selfish, self-centered, egotistic Christians, then we're going to have depressed, disappointed, despair bunch of people gathered every Sunday morning. And then our emotion get ticked off a little bit. We're going to turn the volume for two hours, and we go back home, and at 7 o'clock, that same person who was singing and dancing, is just like you just exchange your Saturday night club disco dancing for another more glorified thing on a Sunday morning. And after when the hype wears down, because there is no substance inside, he commits suicide. We just appeal to the flesh, not to the inner part of the man's soul. And God wants to change all that. To be selfish and self-centered, we need to change our focus. And, and what God has called us to, to pick up our cross and, 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 and Jesus speaking to a man. In Mark chapter 10, the story of the rich young ruler, we call him, that's what they call him, the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus, and from Luke chapter 10, from verse 18 and 17 to 19 to 21, and this is the story. And, and I just want to just, just lay this out here, and, 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 and we'll see what God will say. And so this rich young guy, the Bible called him rich, not wealthy, because there are two different things. You can be rich and not wealthy. Ah, <laughs> uh, the rich, you know, wealthy. And they, so this young, rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he said to him, "He said, good master, good master." And Jesus, now in that conversation, this was a conversation, the discuss between Jesus and this rich young man, rich young guy. I mean, he's young and rich. Handsome, has everything, the whole nine yard, all packaged with a six pack and all that. You know, he's been going to the gym. So he's looking cool. You know, he's coming all far with all his designer clothes and you know, looking everything from head to toe. You know, he has everything in place. And he's, uh, he's, a, he's a very wonderful guy. He's been, he was brought up in the church. He, maybe his father was a vicar, you know, his father was a, he was a senior pastor. He's been an elder. So he, he grew up in the church and, and he's just been following the, all the dictates of the, the religious world. So he's every woman's dream when you see a man like that. He's got it all together, so to speak, outwardly. And he came to Jesus with the same, uh, like what they call today is his swag or whatever. And they say, master, good master. You know, he had good home training. You know, you know that to address. He had some kind of, you know, he had good manners. And I told you weeks ago, you can have one without the other. You know, having good manners doesn't mean you have good character. <laughs> and so he, had, he was very well mannered. He said, good master, what would I do? to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, so God has everything together. But I want to, <laughs> but the question says something about his place. He knows that he doesn't qualify 
for the kingdom of God. And so Jesus now began to tell him, uh, you do this and you, you do this and you do this, don't steal, don't do this, don't cheat, don't, you know, the moral law. And he said, all this, all this I have been doing since I was a little boy. I grew up in the church. I've never drank, I've never smoked. I married as a virgin, everything. I've been doing this since I was a baby. And the Bible says in verse 21 of Matthew 10, and Jesus looked at him. That is the look we need. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he said, you lack one thing. When I taught, he taught me, if I have, if my business is doing well, if I'm married with children, if I'm healthy, if I live in a big house, if I'm successful, <coughs> if I'm, if I name it, claim it, have faith, my faith has got to me a good wife, and my faith has got to me and children, and two boys and two girls, and, and everybody. My faith has kept me from getting sick. I've been, I'm as healthy and as strong as an ox, and I have uh, houses, and I have a uh, vacation, and I have a trailer, and I have all this. Uh, I'm not even in debt, and I'm debt free. My four to five have paid off my mortgage, and I'm living well, just waiting. And you said, I lack. What has my pastor been teaching me this last 20 years? I do, I lack one thing. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Not food. You lack one thing. You lack a revelation of who I am. You lack a commitment to me. Your God is not me. Your God is your belly. You are not serving me for me. You are serving me for what is the need for you. It's all about you. Being called to ministry is not because you love me, it's because you want to stand. You just want to be a big guy, you want to be famous, you want to be popular, there's nothing wrong with that. He, he, it's, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. Ask people, why did you become born again? Why did you become a Christian? And you will hear this funny thing, God, I was sick and God healed me. And, and you know, my marriage was going through this town and the Lord I went to church and they and they prayed for me and God just rescued me and restored me and, and, and a wonderful thing and that's all God does is the rescuer is the restorer but what if God can't do that <clears throat> what if God can heal me what if God cannot feast your marriage what if God can bring you out of bankruptcy? Would you still serve him? If there's nothing in it for you, will you still say, wherever he'll lead, I will go? What if is not capable of all your expectation, which we know is not true. But what if this was the question the young man had to deal with? Jesus said, you lack one thing. The word lack there is a strong word. And every translation, I believe, carried that. It means 
to be deficient. <laughs> it's not just absence of things. It's to be deficient. You know, you, you know for, for doctors, they will tell you, medical people, when somebody is deficient in some areas, you know what I mean, you know, they, they look so healthy and they say their deficiency is lack of vitamin C or this, you know, that, that, that's a hidden hole that cannot be, that is not visible to the naked eye, but they are deficient. There's a deficit in your life. Jesus said, in spite of all the facade you need, Jesus. Let me stop here this morning. The question is, if Jesus asked you this morning, If you put yourself, if we replace the rich young ruler with you standing before Jesus this morning, with all your spiritual credentials and resume, will Jesus still say to you, you lack? You lack what? I grew up in the church, but you lack one thing. I'm a pastor, I've been preaching, I know the Bible from cover to cover. I've memorized Genesis to Revelation, but you lack. I'm a deacon in my church, but you lack. I've been faithful to my wife, but you lack. Do you? Who is your God? Who is your God? Paul said, whose God is their belly? Whose glory is in their shame? Who my earthly things? Ninety-five percent of the people who have no longer committed to God, who were once faithful to God, who no longer believe, and I hear pastors today who've been preaching the gospel for years and say, "Oh, I don't believe anymore." Why not? Yes, I'm not surprised you will not believe because you lack all those years. You lack one thing. Jesus said to the man, "You know the story. Go sell everything." That, you see, when this is where communication becomes an issue. It's not against having things. It's against things having you. The story there was a personal instruction. I don't even know what they teach. And the people say they have their doctors of theology and they can't even understand the scripture. People can't differentiate between Personal instruction and doctrinal instructions. That was a personal instruction. It wasn't a doctrine that Jesus was advocating. That guy had an issue. He said, go sell everything and come what? Follow me. Literally, your God has kept you away from me. Are you following Jesus? Or you are following things? Your waviness and your, your level of consistency and commitment to Jesus is determined by how closely you follow him after him. Is there anything between you and him? Sell that and follow him. Shall we pray? Yes, Jesus. Father, we give you praise. We bless your name this morning. We ask for 
a revelation of who you really are. We ask for a revelation of who you really are to us. Paul cried out that I may know him, Lord Jesus. This is the cry of my heart. And as a shepherd over your flock this morning, I cry on your behalf, Lord, that we will know you, the only true God, and Christ Jesus, whom you have sent. Lord, that we would know you just beyond the miracles and the flesh. That we will embrace the power of the cross. Lord, you said to that man, pick up thy cross. Heavenly Father, we don't know that you. Help us to know you. That whatever is standing between us and that passionate love and pursuit of you, Lord, we've been pursuing happiness because that is what they've sold to us from the pulpit. It's not our fault, Lord. But Lord, begin to realign our heart to begin to pursue and to begin to follow after you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to do a surgical work in our heart. Give us a tender heart that loves you passionately. Help us, Lord. Look at us again, Lord. May we behold your face and see that love. And may we not turn our back on that love. That young man turned his back on that love. Father God, when you look at us and expose the nakedness of our soul to us, may we send it to God and follow you. Help us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can Norman uh, and Ian, can you guys come and help me this morning? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Oh, oh. 
cave of despair and destitution and fear and discouragement. The Lord didn't say much to him. He just said, Elijah, the journey is yet far. Get up and eat. Today, this communion is for strength for you and me. Maybe this morning you're discouraged like me, or tired. The pain in your body is too much now, Lord. I, I can't take this anymore. The crisis in your home is too much. The mockery of being a Christian is too much. You, you just, you, you can't do this anymore, Lord. But I, I want to throw in the towel. Lord, if you don't fix this marriage this week, I'm done. I'm just getting a divorce. If you, if you don't heal me this week, I'm done. I, I, I'm going to commit suicide because this pain is too much. Hopelessness. Because you lack one thing. God came to Elijah and only said to him, He didn't fix. The complaint. It didn't fix the brokenness. It didn't fix the situation. God says, get up and eat, for the journey is yet far. Listen, child of God, God is not done with you yet. He's not done with me. He's not even started with us yet. The journey is yet far. This communion this morning, by faith, is for the strength to run race. So that we don't turn back like the rich young ruler at a point of despair. That we don't get discouraged and become hopeless. We will receive faith to keep marching. Though no one go with us, still we will follow. Can you take your cup and stand up with me, child of God? Father Lord, in the time of great despair in the life of one of your servants. 
you came to him in that cave of despair and destitution. Many of us, oh God, may be in a cave, oh God, of sickness and despair, discouragement, marital crisis this morning, and moral challenges confronting us, not, not knowing which way to turn. Am I a man or woman? Am I a boy or a girl? I don't, I don't know. This, this, is, this is the death. That there's a dead never in my heart, but I want to follow you. Jesus helped them. Just like you stepped into Elijah. He says, Saul, my daughter, I'm not done with you yet. The journey is yet far. We just start to get up and eat. I hear a said strength. May this bread in our hand, O oh God, we sanctify it by faith, O oh God. For strength, O oh God, for spiritual strength to run and not be weary. To mount up wings like eagles, O oh God, spiritually from this day. That whatever has held us down, O oh God, we will be empowered to follow after you. But that we will not talk back. We we'll sanctify the spread in our hand for strength, spiritual vigor, and vitality. For the body of Christ that was broken for us. We we'll receive this in the name of Jesus. Take it, the body of Christ broken for you. And you took the cup. So this is the new covenant in your blood. The blood that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. The blood that cleanses, that restores. The blood, the cross gave us the blood. For the God, we embrace strength. May the voice of the blood begin to speak encouragement to those who are discouraged. Hope to the one who is hopeless this morning. To sanctify the cup in our hands for faith and for strength. Take the blood of Jesus shed for you and me. In the blood of the eternal covenant, which was shed for you and me on the cross of Calvary, over 2,000 years ago that is ever speaking, better taste than the blood of Abel. May that blood speak hope Strength to run and not be weary into your heart for the rest of the year. To him who is able to keep you from falling, may he keep you strong in him and in his love and in his power. Thank you, eternal Lord, for me. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit to rest and abide with you and your family for now and forevermore, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. God bless you.